Good morning to all of you. I'm Dr. Mohamed Badin Ali Professor of Strategic Studies at the National Defense College of the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi, and uh, it's a pleasure to present this uh, research and this work that I did with my friend and colleague, Dr. Mohamed Bouchiri, Professor of International Relations at uh, Hassan, the first university in Sittat, Morocco. And uh, we worked on uh, Morocco and Turkey post-EU membership uh, Daniel and uh, the regional spheres as uh, alternatives. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with him, and uh, we are really sorry to not be uh, available at that time due to the times difference and also some uh, teachings and the teaching obligations in our uh, respective institution. But it's a pleasure to send you this uh, this recording. So uh, Morocco and Turkey post EU membership Daniel the regional spheres as alternatives. So I will start with uh, an introduction. After that, I will uh, talk about uh, the EU's policies towards uh, Morocco, the advanced uh, status uh, that was not, uh, not yet a membership. After we'll talk about Turkey and European uh, Union, uh, then Morocco and the regional spheres, so Sub-Saharan Africa, and Turkey and the uh, MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. Let's start. So first, uh, European Union's relation with both uh, Morocco and Turkey date back to the 60s, when both countries signed uh, different trade agreements with the European Union, and two decades later, they uh, wanted to become members of uh, the EU. However, both of them were denied the membership implicitly or explicitly, as we will see. And due to um, geograph geographical reasons, for example, Morocco was denied of EU membership since it does not belong to the European continent. Of course, it's a North African country. Meanwhile, in the Turkish case, uh, Turkish request received a positive response when the European Commission acknowledged Turkey's potential for the membership while expressing some political and uh, economic concerns that change also uh, depending the historical period, as we will see. So the situation of both of them with EU is uh, different due to uh, geography and due also to some political and economic reasons. So let's start with Morocco and the EU. Why Morocco got an advanced status and not the membership. So we have to first to talk about the proximity, the geographical proximity between Morocco and Europe uh, was always a factor, a permanent factor in the fluctuating uh, relations between peace and war in the history. And since the independence of uh, Morocco in 1966, the economic relation increased and became very important for both parties. For that reason, both parties signed the first trade agreement in 1969, and uh, during the following decades, Morocco uh, developed uh, its relation with uh, the Europeans as uh, independent countries and also as uh, EU to uh, benefit from their economic integration. And also, it was a way for Morocco to achieve its economic development. Uh, it's also important to note that Morocco with uh, EU uh, had divergent strategies and uh, point of views vis-a-vis -vis one another. Morocco had always high aspiration in its relations with Europeans, with the membership as the ultimate goal. But the Europeans always considered Morocco as no more than an important partner, a privileged partner, but not a member or a possible member. Uh, Morocco also was seen as a supply Europe with the manpower after the war and later the gendarme of Europe vis-à-vis -vis the South Mediterranean immigration in general, not only from Morocco, but from all North Africa and also Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in the period following Morocco's independence, so Morocco's independence was in uh, 1956, the kingdom as uh, was economy, economically dependent on the European market and applied twice for um, an European membership in 1984 and in 1987, but it was denied 
We have also to consider that during that period of the 80s, Morocco decided to leave the African Union. Uh, so it's also something important to, to consider uh, the project or the, yes, the project to, to become a member of uh, what was uh, the economic uh, European uh, project uh, in the 80s was also a response as, uh, to the consequences of the, of the decision to leave uh, what was the African Union at that time due to uh, the question of the Sahara that uh, continued to, to be uh, since uh, the 1960s, in reality, just after the independence as uh, the priority of the Moroccan foreign policy. Uh, in early 90s, uh, the newly established EU, after the Treaty of Maastricht in 1992, uh, 1993, uh, sought to develop a new policy with all the Mediterranean region, including Morocco, and uh, the name was the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, uh, that is in reality the Barcelona process. Uh, in the aftermath of this uh, process, Morocco was the first Mediterranean country uh, the EU approached to open discussions about an association agreement, uh, which in 1996 uh, was uh, adopted and uh, started really to enter into force in 2000. And uh, during the past decade, Morocco made sure that the uh, EU would not grant uh, its full membership. So this is something important to consider for uh, the next development on, in that presentation. Uh, in 2000, the new king that uh, started uh, his reign in 1999 outlined Morocco's long-term objective with the EU should be more and better an association and perhaps for some time to come a little less than the membership. So Morocco is uh, looking for a specific and a unique uh, agreement with uh, EU. Uh, the increase this strong relation with EU did not deviate uh, Morocco from uh, opening up to its uh, regional sphere, that is sub-Saharan Africa, as we will see. Uh, the King, Mohammed VI, uh, launched a new policy seeking, uh, wanted, <coughs> so that he wanted to develop its economic and political relations as a way to counterbalance uh, its dependency on the EU and uh, also uh, to achieve an economic and geopolitical power for Morocco and uh, using these historical relations with Sub-Saharan Africa as a uh, uh, an advantage and also to become a hub as we will see. So Morocco and uh, its regional sphere, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, since 1999, uh, the king has put his kingdom on the track of becoming a regional economical power. Uh, the first step to be taken domestically were to elevate millions of Moroccans out of poverty, modernize the nation infrastructure, and also attract FDI and start a big investment in clean energy, uh, especially solar, solar and now green hydrogen. Uh, internationally, in addition to the diversification of its partners, the kingdom looked south on its uh, African sphere. Here in this map, you can see all the uh, footprint of Morocco's private sector in Africa, and you can see how Morocco is now uh, present with its different companies in very different countries. It started with West Africa uh, because of historical uh, relations and geographic uh, proximity. And now, as you can see, the presence of Morocco is also in the eastern part of Africa and also in the southern part of the continent. So the private sector, the Moroccan private sector, especially uh, financial sector, banks, insurance is uh, present in many, many countries and they gave the opportunity uh, to Morocco to build a good and clear and strong economic diplomatic uh, strategy. In 2017, Morocco decided to rejoin the African Union and a year later uh, joined the African Union Peace and Security Council. This return to the Moroccan family, uh, to the African family, sorry, can be uh, 
uh, a clear, considered as a clear demonstration of uh, Morocco's uh, recourse to its regional sphere. Meanwhile, it works hard to improve its relations with Europe. Recently, Morocco launched uh, a new initiative called the Atlantic Initiative to link the Sahel countries to the Atlantic Ocean. Meanwhile, the kingdom is working on major mega project to transport Nigerian gas to Europe through the ocean, and it will uh, give the opportunity to a total of 15 countries, 13 plus Morocco and Nigeria, to also be connected with mega pro this mega project um, regarding gas, and also to connect it with uh, Europe and give the opportunity to the kingdom to uh, continue reinforce its position as a hub in Africa between Europe and Africa, but also between the Americas with the Atlantic Initiative and uh, Africa. Turkey is in a different position now that we finish with uh, Morocco. Turkey and uh, EU developed uh, very interesting uh, relations. We had different uh, partnerships, uh, different uh, tentative of uh, the Turks to uh, become members of the European Union. They faced uh, many critiques regarding their political and uh, judicial system. The role of the army during a long time was considered as an obstacle uh, to the Turkish adhesion to the EU. Uh, when the AKP was elected in 2002, uh, Erdogan, when he became prime minister in 2003, started uh, a series of reforms, especially of a judicial system, uh, that gave the opportunity to uh, Turkey to meet with the standards, with the European standards, and also to use it as uh, an argument to reduce the influence of the military power in politics. But it was not sufficient for uh, the uh, Turks to become part of EU. Many critics started uh, due to uh, politicians in Europe, uh, especially in France and Germany. At that moment, UK, that was still a member of EU uh, before the Brexit, uh, was advocating for in favor of Turkey. But France, Germany, and many of other countries like Austria, Netherlands were against uh, for uh, political and ideological reasons uh, due to the fact that only 3% uh, of the Turkish territory is in Europe, but also due to religion. It's a secular country called Laik in its constitution, but it's still a country that has 90% of its population that is a Muslim population. So for some politicians, uh, it was a problem from Europe. And also the demographic aspect. Uh, the European Parliament it has a very specific rule. The number of MPs depend on the population of each country. And uh, the Turkish population is bigger than Germany and France, who are the, the leaders. Germany has around 82 million people, and France uh, 68, and Turkey uh, close to 90. So if Turkey becomes one day a member of EU, uh, Turkey will have the biggest number of MPs uh, in Strasbourg, in the European Parliament, and it's also a problem for many countries. So this uh, will give us the opportunity also to explain why Turkey uh, choose MENA as an alternative, we can say. Uh, first, because uh, under the AKP, who arrived uh, to the power, uh, power in 2002, Ankara's opened to the Arab world as a, as a result of a structural shift in foreign policy. And they wanted to adopt an economy-driven uh, foreign policy. So between 2002 and 2011, the Turkish business state couple was effective. Each major cooperation project was supported and promoted by the Turkish state. However, this uh, strategy, geostrategic vision uh, defined by Ahmed Davutoglu and uh, totally uh, uh, supported by Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who was prime minister, uh, was clashing with the reality of the Arab Spring in 2011. Uh, we have to mention that since the foundation of the Republic in 1923, and more especially after the Second World War, the Turkish diplomacy has been organized around two principles. The first one, to guarantee the security of the territory, strategic alliance with the US and membership of the NATO in 1951, and also to assume the westernization of the country embodied by the desire to enter 
the EU. So these two principles were the keys and uh, the foreign policy and everything changed after 2002 and uh, victory of uh, the AKP. Since 2002 and the coming to power of the AKP, zero problems with the neighbors uh, has been replaced, has replaced, sorry, the, what I mentioned before, the, the two principles. This slogan was developed and created by Ahmed Daoutoulou, who started as a diplomatic advisor of Erdogan after that Minister of Foreign Affairs. And when Erdogan became president with the constitutional reform, Ahmed Daoutoulou became prime minister before the resign in 2016. Um, some uh, analysts consider and some scholars consider that this zero problem with neighbors can also be called neo-Ottomanism. Uh, due to the exaltation of the Turkish Ottoman past in uh, symbolic places like uh, Kirkuk uh, in the uh, Middle East uh, or Sarajevo in the Balkans uh, by the AKP government. It's also a way to uh, signify its accession to the status of an emerging power. So uh, Ankara increased assertiveness in the Middle East and North Africa as part of its emerging power diplomacy. This region is seen as an area of influence necessary for the Turkey's assertion as a power on the international stage. And in addition to North Africa, the Eastern Mediterranean coast, especially around Egypt and Turkey, exhibits an enorm enormous potential for producing green hydrogen that could be exported to Europe. In the interim, the area could potentially uh, work as an extra source of natural gas, and the EU's green energy goals that are very ambitious may benefit from uh, what Turkey is uh, doing now with warming relations with Egypt uh, and the Gulf states. So uh, Turkey is becoming, is a regional power, is becoming an emerging power. They are now candidate for the BRICS. Uh, it's uh, so, uh, news that has a few days. Let's see if the BRICS plus will accept Turkey. Turkey is a strategic country due to the geography between Europe and Middle East, between Europe and Central Asia, with also the access of the Black Sea and the two straits that uh, Turkey control. Um, so this country is a key country, and uh, if they did not uh, have the possibility to join the EU due to the EU obstacles, we can see that Turkey is looking for some alternatives, uh, especially in the Middle East and in North Africa. Uh, we saw also that uh, the economic driven uh, foreign policy of the first decade of AKP uh, changed a little bit. Now we have also a military component, especially with the Turkish presence in Libya, the Turkish presence in Syria, and also the Turkish incursions in Iraq due to the presence in the north of Syria and the north of Iraq, close to the Turkish borders, the presence of some Kurds, Kurdish groups that Turkey considers as partners of the PKK, and the PKK in Turkey is considered as a terrorist group and as a threat for the national security since uh, the, the 1980s. So this aspect gives the opportunity to Turkey to become a military regional power, an economic regional power, with uh, strong ambitions. And uh, if they cannot be part of EU, they will still become, uh, and they will continue, sorry, to, to be a strong partner and a key partner for the EU, like Morocco from the other side. And we can also see that uh, the alternatives that these two countries, Morocco and Turkey, looked for with Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, MENA region, uh, for each country, give them also the possibility to become a regional economic power and also to be seen as uh, differently by the EU and uh, the key uh, partnership between these two countries without membership, of course, uh, will continue and uh, will become more and more important for the Europeans due to economic uh, partnership, security and uh, migration, also partnership that are important and the question of energy that both of them uh, can uh, help with the Nigeria-Moroccan uh, gas project that I mentioned, and also uh, the hub that uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey is becoming a hub for the energy coming from the Middle East, but especially from Central Asia and from uh, one of the most important uh, partners of um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president Aliyev of Azerbaijan.
Thank you very much. I hope that uh, it was clear. We start, uh, we tried to discuss uh, about uh, these uh, two countries and two interesting uh, projects that uh, I tried to develop as alternatives. So thank you very much. And also thank you to Mohamed Bouchihi, my friend and colleague for uh, this opportunity. And thank you uh, for uh, to all of you for this invitation and for the for listening to me. And uh, we uh, cannot answer to your question, but it was a real pleasure to be with you uh, online and uh, with this uh, video. Thank you very much.